northwestern India experienced the invasion or presence of Alexander in 327 BCE after he routed the Achaemenid rule in A Asia Minor. Alexander actually crossed Asia Minor to challenge the Achaemenid Empire who was then ruling the entire region from Egypt to the areas of Afghanistan. What happened is that he fought three wars and among these three wars, two wars were fought with Darius III himself and finally the Achaemenid Empire lay prostrate at the feet of Alexander. What we find is that after being crowned the king of the Trans-Oxus region, Alexander now decided to move further east, cross the Hindu Kush and take hold of the areas of northwestern India. We learn about his eastern campaigns from the historians of Alexander who accompanied him and they are Justin, Plutarch and Orion. What we find in their writings is that they are talking about the northwest India where they have seen a number of rulers but we do not have a single ruler like that of Magadha in the Ganga Valley during the penetration of the Greek rule in the northwestern part of India. When Alexander landed in Herat, that is the area region, he conquered there and established many cities. This was the common trend with Alexander that he was known as the founder of many cities. So after conquering Herat, Alexander moved into the region of the Helmand Basin together with his troops and came to the area of Kabul Begram region. There he established another city which was known as Alexandria of the East. In Alexandria he decided to settle garrison and this was then ruled by his general Philip. So there were Greek and Macedonian settlers in this region. He moved further east and came to the region of Arachosia which is the present Kandahar region and in Arachosia also he founded another city. It is said that perhaps this was the famous Alexandropolis but we are not sure about it. From later accounts we learn that Arachosia became Greek in culture and we have a text of 1st century BC which talks about Arachosia. Uh, the name of the text is Stathmoi Parthikoi and it is said that Esti de Elenis that is it is Greek. So the Greek character of the city was given by the foundation of the city by Alexander. When he was moving further east we find that there were two generals. One was known as Kofes and the other was Asageti and these generals submitted to him without any problem. Kofias obviously the name suggests that he belonged to a region which was near the Kabul river. Kabul is was known by the Greeks as Kofan. The next stage in Alexander's campaign was the sieging of the hill fort of Aurnas which is known in Sanskrit literature as Varana. In fact Panini mentions this hill fort and this is very important mythologically also because the siege of Ornas or Varna indicates the strength of Alexander because in Greek mythology we have that even Heracles could not destroy the fort of Ornas or Varna. So this was a kind of achievement for Alexander and he celebrated this success by sacrificing and having feast and he built altars in the name of Minerva and uh, the other deity was victory. Now after this reducing this fort we find that Alexander posted a garrison in the region under a general who was Indian and in the Greek literature we find that his name is Sisikotus. perhaps in Indian uh, literature it will be Shashigupta or, the, or some like. Uh, uh, let me quote from Orion, we find that Orion records that Alexander went in pursuit of the fleeing defenders of Ornos who were led by a brother of the Asakanian chief killed in Masaga. So this suggests that he could be very vindictive when he wanted to and the, the persons who had actually kept uh, tried to uphill the hill fort 
was not left out and they were completely massacred and executed. The next phase, um, uh, important phase in Alexander's campaign is the control of the region of Nisa. Now there is a very interesting anecdote about the origin of Nisa. It is said that Nisa was founded by uh, Dionysus and it was named Nisa after his Nars. Now when Alexander reached Nisa, the people did not go for any kind of rebellion. What they did was they sent mission to Alexander by saying that the people of Nisa belonged to the same kin because they were also Greeks and they wanted to live undisturbed and there should not be any kind of conquest rather they submitted in a different form giving him the story of their origin. So that was taken into account by Alexander and though Nisa was under his rule but the people of Nisa were left undeterred. Coming to the final stage of the campaign, we find that he moves into the Swad Valley. Now if you imagine the map of or the geography of the region of Afghanistan, we find that the Swad Valley had very important Buddhist centers also. And in Swat, there were two regions, one was Birkot and the other was Udigram, which were very important towns or rather we can call it cities of that period. So Alexander along with his uh, troops and his Greek generals or Macedonian generals came to this region and wanted to attack or conquer this, uh, the two uh, main cities Bazira and the other was Ora. So he left this area to his general Python and from there when he was still encamping at this region and was planning to move into Taxila, he found an embassy coming from the Taxilan king Omphis or Ambhi and the another name of the Taxilan king was Taxilis. Now this Taxilis or Ambhi was newly crowned and he did not want to defy Alexander knowing the strength of Alexandrian forces. So he offered his submission to Alexander. Alexander was naturally very happy and he conducted a huge darbar and where Alexander gave many of his um, spoils from the Persian war to the generals of Ambhi or the people who had come. So naturally the Macedonian generals did not like the fact that Alexander was so liberate in giving out his spoils of the war of the Persian war to these Indian counterparts. However, this giving away of gifts earned him a very strong ally in Ambhi and in all the further expeditions we find that Ambhi always accompanied him with a huge amount of army. Now beyond Taxila, when we come to Taxila, we can always remember that there the regions of Taxila and the region around Jhelum, these two were regions who were not at a very comfortable situations because the ruler of Jhelum was Porus. And we have this story recounted to us that Porus was a very brave man. Alexander made all kinds of preparations to cross the Jhelum. So he were settled, he was encamping on the banks of the Jhelum and was planning how to cross the river because on the other side of the Jhelum, Porus was standing with his huge army. So now let us see what the Greek uh, tell us about the number of uh, the armies or the, about the contingent which, that, uh, which Porus had. So this was quite a huge amount of uh, army which Porus gathered to encounter Alexander. Now Alexander realized that if his army, particularly his horses, confront the elephants first, there will be chaos and confusion. So he planned his army in such a way that in between there the foot soldiers will be there but they will be flanked by the cavalry and other and the chariots. So that there won't be any confusion 
and what when Poros was op waiting for him on the other side, he kept or he tried to deceive Poros by showing that he could be attacking him any time, but and his kept his army marching to and fro, but he did not attack. When Poros realized that there was no chance of any attack for a, for a some time, he naturally was not so cautious and taking this advantage, Alexander actually attacked the army of Porus and he crossed the Jhelum. On hearing about this, Porus sent his son to confront Alexander first while he was waiting for him on the drier ground. The son went with 2000 uh, elephants and chariots, but unfortunately he was a no match for Alexander's army and Alexander himself. So the brave son had to fall in the war. Along with this son, there were other generals also who were defeated and some of them died. Now the Greek historians give us a story about this confrontation and we find that when Alexander entered into the dry grounds, Porus and Alexander had a real fight and it was also raining heavily. So it was very difficult for the army, particularly the archers of Porus's army to fight because the bows were going down on the uh, sandy banks of the river. In the meantime, fresh Greek soldiers arrived under Craterus. So the Greek side was very strong and finally Porus could not stand the strength of Alexander. But Alexander was immensely uh, impressed by the valor of Porus and he did not want that Porus should die. So when Porus was going back, he sent messengers. First Ambi went, but naturally since Ambi was the enemy of Porus, Porus did not listen to Ambi and later on Alexander sent another messenger who finally caught hold of Porus, brought, captured him and brought him back to Alexander. And there goes this famous story. Uh, which we learn from the Greek accounts that when Alexander asked Porus that how should he be treated, Porus says like a king. So this whole narrations are given only in the Greek accounts. Unfortunately, the Indian accounts are totally silent about this. But what we find is that Alexander was so happy with this victory that he issued a medallion. So we now have a medallion which describes Alexander's victory over Porus and how he was pursuing Porus and Porus is depicted on with his elephant and Alexander with his horse. Now after the conquest of the region of Porus that is the region on the bank of the, the area on the bank of the Jhelum, Alexander gave away all the areas which he conquered to Porus himself and Porus was allowed to rule it independently. This gained Alexander the friendship of Porus and naturally he accompanied Alexander in all his expeditions uh, towards the river Chenab and Beas. The Greek accounts tell us there was a strong fight in the bre uh, brick fort of Sangala. Now the Sangala fort is very important because here we have a kind, uh, a name of a tribe, we learn a name of a tribe called Kathai or Kathai who were very strong and they did not want to give away their fort. So a strong battle took place where Porus helped Alexander with 5000 or 6000 armies and naturally the Kathai people had finally to give over. These people were taken as slaves by Alexander and the, the massacre that happened was quite huge. So this was a huge amount and these captured people were taken as slaves by Alexander and later on we know that these slaves were transshipped to uh, Macedon, Macedonia or to Greece. We know the name of a king known as Sophites, uh, the Indian term would be Shobhuti, who actually submitted to Alexander after all these happenings. 
Shobhati is uh, is very important for us because later on we find that he actually struck a coin. This coin was actually struck following the Alexandrian medallions or Alexandria's coin issues. Now, after defeating uh, or uh, the region, the people around the river Beas and Chenab, Alexander was keen on moving towards the Ganga Valley. He had, while he was encamping on the in the river Beas, he had heard about the great Magadhan emperor who was ruling over a vast region. And this was obviously the Nanda dynasty. The Greek accounts talk about the ruler whose name was Agrams in some or Zandrams in other. But he was of course the Nanda rulers at that time who were in charge of Magadha and Alexander was very much willing to move further east. Unfortunately, his army men, his compatriots did not agree to this. They were all very tired and they did not want to move further. As it is, many of their fellow men were killed and they now wanted to go back. So Alexander realized this and there were celebrations. He, as I mentioned earlier, the altars were created, 12 altars were erected and then he prepared for his return journey without going into further east. We do not know what would have been the result if Alexander had finally come to the east because if we go by the Greek accounts again, we find that the ruler of the east, that is the Nanda dynasty and particularly during Alexander's period, the ruler was Dhananda, he had also a very huge army. So that episode is not very clear that what would have happened if Alexander had actually crossed, uh, come to the Ganga Valley. When Alexander was preparing to return, that is we call it the return march, what he did was that he divided the region into his Macedonian generals and the rulers, the Indian rulers like Porus, Ambhi and there were Ambastonai, so Ambashta was another group. So there were some other rulers also, they were allowed to keep their provinces with them and the other regions where, where the Macedonian rulers were ruling or there were Macedonian governors, these were being supported or helped by the Indian compatriots. So this was the general arrangement with which Alexander made and then he started on his return march. His return journey was not also very smooth. Now the Malavas and the Shudrakas were bent upon confronting Alexander and they did not want Alexander to cross their territory. Alexander planned to defeat or attack the Sibois or the Shibis first who were also ally of these groups. So the Shibis were dis uh, defeated and finally there was this huge confrontation between the confederacy of the Malloy and the Oxidrakoi with that of Alexander. So the non-monarchical groups which were very strong and which were had uh, having small pockets of their own in the territories along the Chenab, along the Ravi were completely routed by Alexander. After that, Alexander approached Sindh. In Sindh, there was a ruler, Musicanas or Mushikanas. Uh, we are not very sure about it. Now, at first, Musicanas was not that well aware of Alexander's uh, coming and he did not offer his submission and he was planning that if Alexander had came or attacked him, then he would give him a good fight. But ultimately, when Alexander suddenly attacked his territory, he had no other option and he was very prudent to submit immediately to avoid further disgrace and to save his countrymen to be turned into slaves. 
So, Alexander got the favor of Musicanus and then there was another very inconsolable army or group of people who were known as the in the um, Greek literature we they are called the Brahmins and these Brahmins also wanted to give a good fight to Alexander. They had given a fight but unfortunately they were completely massacred and all their people were taken as slaves. These kind of confrontations were happening while he, on his return journey but Alexander was successful in destroying this small non-monarchical or monarchical principalities and here is another case of the Sambas who were also defeated by Alexander. Finally, Alexander reached the Indus Delta which is known as the Patala region or in literature we have the name Patalini and this Patala region was controlled by rulers, uh, by kings and there were a group of elders who actually looked after the territory. They immediately submitted to Alexander and naturally Alexander got control of this region. Now, this was very important because the delta of Indus was navigable and through this region one could reach the sea and finally taking the Persian Gulf route one could, re could reach the areas of uh, Western Asia. Now, Alexander then planned his return journey in three possible ways. One was he sent a group of his people through Nearchus who took the sea route from the Indus Delta, they went into the Persian Gulf region and finally reached their destination. But this was not a very wise decision for him because this entire stretch was very tiring and it was arduous. Now, if we look at the impact of Alexander and if we think about his administrative setup, we find that Alexander wanted to make northwestern India an integral part of his empire. This was very clear because when he left in northwestern India, he did not just leave the country, he made certain arrangements, certain administrative arrangements where we find that the entire region which was conquered by him were divided into two parts. So, one part was given to certain Macedonian generals and the other part was given to the Macedonian generals like Python was one who uh, had a larger share of uh, his area, Seleucus was another, but they were also being helped or accompanied by the Indians uh, who actually support Alexander. So, the whole administrative setup was such that there was a total control of the Greeks or the Macedonians and when he established cities or towns as he moved on along the coast, we find that he had this idea of the trade network in his mind because trade with the west was opening up and the route which he followed which actually uh, Nearchus followed and he uh, wanted Nearchus to explore that route through the Palatian Gulf would help in the trading contacts between India and the West Asia. So, the whole idea was to make India a part, uh, the Northwest India in particular, an integral part of his empire. But naturally, when the general leaves and it is left to the certain his subordinates, there will be chaos and confusion and such thing happened here too and there were fightings among his generals and the Indian compatriots also. Now, regarding the impact of Alexander's invasion in the India, in India or uh, in, the, in the culture of India, there are two kinds of opinion. One kind of historians, for example, if you look at uh, Vincent Smith, it is very natural that a colonialist historian like Vincent Smith will find huge impact of Alexander's invasion in the Indian civilization or Indian culture. 
but this whole idea has been challenged by other historians who feel that in a in a very short interlude it is not possible to have an entire cultural influence uh, which has been argued by uh, Vincent Smith. The most important contribution of Alexander's invasion, we can say that it actually opened up communication between Greece and India and made the way for the more interactive intercourses between the two. So, the cultural effect, uh, the possible cultural effect uh, could be seen uh, in many cases, for example, in art, currency, economy and astronomy uh, where India learned a lot and for the Greeks, we find that the Greeks learned about India from this campaign of Alexander. So, in some way Alexander's campaign had some impact in the overall understanding of the past.